Well, you know, the elders always say this wherever I go. They say, take care of the plants and animals, and they'll take care of you. It's kind of like you're bringing up your brothers and sisters or your children. When you get old, then they help you. It's, it's, it's basically reciprocity. I see restoration not as a product, although I've done those kinds of restoration projects where you have a defined timeline and budget, but as a process, a process that engages all of our capacities, you know, including our spiritual capacity, with the land. The land is our mother, literally, and not just figuratively. That land sustains us. So we need to, to embrace for our own mental health and for our own sanity and for our own way to, to, to kind of wind our way through some pretty perilous ground now in the world to be based on a land base, to be part of a forest or part of a prairie, or, or part of a desert, or part of a coastal system that we learn. We learn the names of the plants, we learn the names of the animals, we relate to them. In the Indian way, and I'm Otum uh, Indian as well as Chicano and Anglo, my heritage, uh, in the Indian way, you need to re give back as you take. You, in other words, the Mother Earth gives us sustenance. We get our livelihood from the earth. And so we also owe at the same time something that back to the earth. And restoration kind of fulfills that responsibility. We have ceremonies, almost all of our ceremonies are about renewing either yourself or the earth. We call them world renewal ceremonies. There's many kinds. Uh, where I live we have the world renewal ceremonies of the Yurok and Kuruk and Hupa peoples, you know, with the jump dance and the white deer skin dance or the sun dance on the Lakota reservation in the plains the sun dance was practiced widely all these are about f fulfilling our responsibility as human beings to be caretakers or caregivers elders often use the word caregivers to the earth to give back spiritually and practically and we never made the distinction as so many of the world's religions have, especially Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, of a separation between spirit and matter. In other words, God re made the earth in those three religions in six days, and he or she rested on the seventh. We have a yearly or annual, almost perpetual responsibility to participate in creation, in recreation of the earth, because the earth is, and the forests and the, all the landscape is constantly in flux and in change as we are. And so we're engaging continually. As we use the land up, we also give back in ceremony. We, we have a phrase that goes like this, setting the world right at that point. So as a process and not just as a product, which is never finished, by the way. I've never seen a, I've been doing this 33 years and I've never seen a finished restoration at all. I mean, they're always in process because we're such tiny islands in a vast sea of degradation, fragmentation, pollution. No place on earth is immune now from human influence. But we're trying to pr establish enough models on the ground, enough refugia, enough reserves of conservation and restoration, enough parks that are also restored, and hopefully by local people supporting that effort to enable us to get through we, the bad times and even the worst times that we know are going to be here in the future. So we have a great obligation to our children to continue teaching them about this kind of relationship, this renewing relationship with nature, this process of continual engagement in restoration. And the process we're restoring ourselves. Well, I think we have to restore our relationship to the land on a personal level. It's something that we have to actively go and do I'm not sure that um, teachers can help us. But they, can, they can help us, but they can't do it for us. We've got to learn about, become acquainted with, become a part of, uh, and understand a, an ecosystem. Um, and because, well, and, and this is a necessary thing for us to do because ecosystems are very powerful things. And they have the ability to eliminate us if we become too discordant. The, um, 
And on the other hand, um, they may also be strong enough to be able to withstand over the long, long haul to withstand any of the deviations that we cause to them. And this is one of the things that um, that I think we have to be careful that we understand the process well enough to know when it is broken, when it is not working. Uh, it might be working against us because of something that we're doing, but it's working. And um, it's, if we want to restore it, we've got to restore perhaps our position in relation to the ecosystem rather than making the ecosystem into something that, uh, that we think it should be. I think the most important part about restoration, uh, and again my point of view is coming from indigenous community where I'm from, has to do with the respect and reciprocal relationship with place. And often when you talk to an indigenous person, you ask them who they are, they'll tell you where you're from. And so if the place where you're from is degraded and poor quality, so much of the aspects of the land, the quality of the water, the sea, reflects into the society who lives in that place. And so I think in many ways, for me at least, restoration involves both the social or cultural aspects of community as well as the ecological aspects of community. And the two are very much interlinked um, across generations and across through time. And so with that as far as restoration as a priority it it has to help people understand the needs of their place and sometimes we use the word forest health or ecological integrity but in many ways that's how we assess it it's it's a reflection of health and and people are only as healthy as the watershed in which they live in many regards because of the services that the place can provide to them and so with indigenous communities at least historically uh, the place that we lived was our pharmacy our supermarket and a hardware store. And so if there's been aspects of that that have been degraded, uh, then to restore that relationship is restore all those qualities that provide to you all the foods and medicines and, and, and material items that you need to live as, as a human being in a respectful, ways, respectful way and place. And I think another part about restoration is ecological literacy. We talk a lot about environmental education. It's being aware of things that need, are needed for the environment. But then literacy part of it is understanding what to do with that knowledge. And within my community, when elders teach young people information, that knowledge is a sense of responsibility. And that's how you develop your literacy, and that's how you develop your sense of place. And so the act of, gener uh, the act of restoration itself, whether it's for fisheries or it's language restoration, whatever restoration may be, a uh, social ecological phenomenon that you're doing and, and participating in, then I think it has to take place through many generations, young people, middle-aged people, older elders, that have a role in making a better place for where they live. And, and each person will have a different role in what they do. And I think, uh, you know, using Sam and I brought this along because I think it's important Salmon in the Northwest is, is very important to many indigenous cultures. It's just one species that is representative of the wealth that our watersheds possess. But yet it's reflective too in the wealth of the cultures in the Northwest indigenous people was reflective of the wealth that the salmon as one of those species brought to them. But it took management, it took care for that. And today when you look at restoration, many indigenous people see it as a responsibility that was handed down from them, from the Creator. And so restoration in many ways ties into the world renewal responsibility. Fixing the earth and bringing the earth into balance as many of the, uh, the world renewal dances or the ceremonies talk about. That's what restoration is. It's, uh, it's making things right with the place that you live to encompass the greater biological community. And I think part of that, and especially how we face restoration today, is within our social community when there's been insult or injury before we have the new, the new dance for that year and celebrate our new year you have to make payment you have to acknowledge the wrongdoings and an important thing that comes out of that when we think about restoration on the land 
or a particular species or habitat is to have this reconciliation of what has happened, the history of place, and when you can address the history of place openly, you know, there's going to be some nasty things that might be revealed in that, both that happen to the people there as well as to the species that are there or the plant communities and the land itself. Acknowledge those um, atrocities in many ways, but then that gives you a point of reconciliation, and then you make a form of retribution, a form of payment, and that might involve community openly acknowledging what has happened to the land, and then you can move forward. And when you have that ability to move forward, then you can heal old wounds and start the healing process. And that's what restoration should be in many ways. It should be the healing of people to place and, and fostering a relationship that's healthy between people and the place that they live. And in between that is all the other species that both in many ways because of management now rely upon humans or humans rely upon them. You know, it's, it's, it's a dual relationship that goes back and forth. And so when I think of the work that I do today, looking at fire ecology, looking at uh, documenting traditional ecological knowledge that in many ways have stories, you know, within those stories, I think of our, our stories and our myths and our legends as the ecological prescription of living in place. Because when the stories I learned growing up, when I'm out amongst the land, there are morals or ethics or values or prescriptions in there that tell me how I should conduct myself for the place that I live. And so if I can instill those values in the people that I work with and the younger children as they grow up and my own children and grandchildren eventually to come, then I say, well, my effectiveness monitors for my restoration efforts that are community and ecologically based will be how full their smokehouse is. Because when you have the diversity and abundance of species, whether it's fish or deer or elk or other game that can go in the smokehouse, that means that we're caring for our environment in enough of a way that we can afford to harvest some of those, but yet nurture ourselves as we as well as we nurture nature around us. Well, I have always uh, thought that it required first discovering the proper scale at which to undertake this re reconnection. Uh, I came to believe fairly early that attempts by individuals to restore their relations to the natural world could only go so far, uh, and that by nature the, the, the attempt that's more whole and that the, uh, the human genome really demands is that you pursue these uh, the, the, this, this search for uh, restoration of relation in community, uh, because that's, uh, that's, that's really how humans have evolved. And humans have evolved in small communities and have generally related to uh, uh, at least sedentary people, have related to relatively small places. Um, so it almost by accident, uh, I've found that uh, my community's work in my watershed was at, at a very optimal scale. I was a 300 square mile watershed uh, that was too large for most individuals to wrap their mind around and required the imagination and uh, information of, of a much larger part of the population. So there was a, a natural inducement uh, to, to uh, imagine and work together. And that, uh, that has only gotten stronger over the, over the 20 or so years that we have pursued these objectives. You know, I think, I'm thinking a lot lately about fragmentation, that we live in a country of such fragmented landscape and it goes to other levels, crippled communities and broken families. And, and so I think restoration really needs to happen on lots of different levels. We have to restore function to the family, to the, and I'm talking about family in a big sense, to the community, to the landscape. Um, I, I, a lot of people say I'm an environmental activist, but I say I'm, I'm not an activist. I may be trying to keep Bush from trilling for oil in the Arctic or DuPont from 
drill it for mining for titanium in Okefenokee Swamp or stop the rate of development where I, you know, near where I, I am. But really, it's more serious than that. It's more important. It's, I'm trying to help remake a world in which we can be fully human. And so then the question you ask is, what does it mean to be fully human? And for me, the first part of being human means to be absolutely engaged with our landscape, with the flora and fauna, the processes of rain and seasons and weather. There are other parts. You know, I think it also means to be absolutely engaged with the production of food and to know where our food and water comes from, the acquisition of our shelter, you know, to be knowledgeable of the elements of our survival makes us human. And then the other, the, I, there are two more I have come up with so far, and one is to be absolutely engaged with other human beings, our offspring, our parents, our spouses, our neighborhoods, our communities, you know, to understand that there is nothing in between me and you, that we are absolutely connected. And the fourth part of that is to recognize that we're spiritual beings, that we're moored to each other and to all living things by spirit. So it makes this work, holy work, really, spiritual work, the work of being restored to a body of love, Robert Haas, the poet, says. I think about restoration a lot in those terms, and, and also in, the, in, in reading Wendell Berry, he says, you know, that, you know, what can we do that, to make our work again an answer to despair? And that's where I see restoration fit now. It's an answer to despair. It's a great answer. It's us remaking the world. Well, I, I think there are a whole bunch of ways we can use restoration to do that. One of the ways is simply that in order to restore properly, we have to, first of all, learn more about the system and what's missing from it with regards to what kind of goods and services that we want from it. And then, of course, we have to participate very actively with that system to, to restore the, the structures and the functions and the organisms that we think we want there. So you have to learn, and then you have to do. And as a part of that doing, you, you also discover <coughs> that these are all very idiosyncratic systems and that there is no recipe, there is no prescription, uh, that in fact each is uh, sui generis, each is a unique uh, system with unique kinds of, of solutions. So that's, you know, that's clearly how we restore uh, our own connection with the system. And hopefully in that process, develop a, a greater appreciation for the fact that we're a part of it rather than apart from it. Are there some ideas or words or um, inspirations that have come out of the workshop so far that you think are... Um, well, I, th I think there are a lot of interesting metaphors. Um, and, you know, you have to be careful with them because uh, they work for some people and some audiences and not for others but you know one for me was the whole notion of of empowering the ecosystem including ourselves and by that I mean uh, uh, increasing its capacities to do the to fulfill the functions that we want and in that sense sort of empowering or enriching the capabilities of the system that was a very useful concept for me. Uh, some of the other concepts, you know, about uh, marriage and family and home and intimate relationships, you know, I can relate to. I can't necessarily use them directly in what I do and the audiences that I address because I have to generally uh, stay pretty, pretty based in reality and in fact in the in the interactions that I have now that's that that is my role and so it's very interesting to explore some of the metaphors 
and to try to contribute to them. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure they're necessarily particularly useful to me in the role that I'm currently playing. The term humility keeps coming up in our uh, yeah. interviews. Yes. And I use that one all the time. I used it on the first day of this workshop. And uh, I use it with any audience that I deal with, uh, media, a decision maker, uh, science. And, and, you know, to me, if, if there's one lesson in what we have done in the last 50 years and what we've learned in the last 30 or 25 or 30 it has to do with humility, not hubris. And, you know, we've got to watch that just as much in restoration as we, as we should have been watching out for it in our focus on production. The notion, you know, that uh, be humble. You don't know it all yet. And you don't know what all of our goals as a human and needs as a human society are going to be. So always approach your interactions with these systems with great humility. Because you don't know them that well. You know a lot about them, but you don't know everything about them. And you don't know the future that well. So, you know, humility by all stakeholders, I think, is a, is a good principle. From my perspective, I, I look at the term restoration, and in the middle of restoration, and I think what's the heart of restoration, is uh, story. So the, the term is really restoration, And it goes back to something that Thomas Berry said, and that's that uh, uh, our stories are what we use to interpret the world around us, the often confusing signals that we get from the world around us, and that, and that our stories guide our behavior and in terms of our relationship with the world around us. And when our stories fail to, to allow us to protect and preserve the things that we value, then we need a new story. So the idea that we have to restore something means that Somehow we fail to protect or preserve something that we see of value. And the, the first step, the first step, that means our story failed us, uh, failed to guide us in our behavior. And so the first step is restoration, telling a new story, uh, guiding our a new story that will help interpret the world around us and, and help uh, guide our behavior. From the standpoint of salmon, the story that we have been telling is one of, of simplification and control over the production system, including the rivers, as well as the actual reproduction of salmon themselves in terms of hatcheries. Um, that story doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, that story has been causing a slide towards extinction uh, for the last hundred years. Um, we need a new story of our relationship with salmon. Any kind of restoration has to be preceded by a new story, or we get the condition that biologist John Livingston described, and that is that we start generating a whole series of, if we don't get a new story, if we don't tell a new story, if we don't develop a different relationship with the things that we value, then we end up uh, using the old story, and the old stories have a tendency to create a whole string of solutions which do nothing more than perpetuate the problem. So it's a long, long explanation, but uh, restoration to me starts with the, tell the recognition of the need for a new story and the telling of a new story. I think it's a transformative process. Your ideas at the beginning are not the same as your ideas when you have moved on a little further. Uh, Jerry talks a lot about the issue of humility, and you are humbled rapidly. Uh, when you are actually doing on-the-ground restoration. Uh, most projects start off a little wrong. <laughs> uh, we have a kind of preconceived notion about the site. Uh, it's one of the reasons we try to start very gently, uh, really kind of a minimal intervention, because there's a lot to be learned from that landscape. 
But I have found that when a group of people, regardless of their original background, when they really start to focus on the landscape, when they study it, when they seek out living history from the members of their community, that they become expert very rapidly. Um, and the idea that we really have this sort of higher authority that's going to come in and tell us how to do it, I think is a really essential mistake. The object is for us to study our own landscape so intently that our interventions are increasingly positive. I think at a theoretical level, every intervention should be a positive one. Um, I've, I like to think of it in terms of making a habit of restoration, where you begin to think consistently about every time I step into the woods, uh, whether I'm working in the woods or walking through the woods, uh, you know, how is this going to be a positive relationship for uh, both me and the other beings around me? There are two metaphors that, that resonate most with me in terms of, of restoration. Um, one of them is healing, and that healing as part of a process of coming back to wholeness. And so, of course, it fits the, the metaphor of, of the body and wellness in general. Um, and the, the other metaphor that resonates with me, since I'm a musician, I guess, is, um, is that of music. Is, is the fact that whether it's, uh, it's drumming or an orchestra or a, a singing group, all of us is, all God's children's got a place in the choir. <laughs> um, all of the, of the pieces have a sound, and if you remove any one of those pieces, the sound changes. So a soundscape perspective is, um, is a lot about what a healthy ecosystem provides and what we're trying to create as we restore land. Um, there's an inherent humility that must be part of the process. When you're in a choir, you're not a solo singer. Um, and so it's, it's a matter maybe not so much of knowing your part, because the parts may shift, but uh, all of us have, have voices that are important to the whole piece. So um, what I think restoration is about is, is both looking backward with a sense of historical perspective of what a place or a condition or a process was, but also knowing that it's never completely to be that way. It is continuing in an evolutionary process forward, as are we, our consciousness is very much similar, I think, uh, to the process of an ecological restoration. One of the things that I think is really important when we think about ecological restoration is the notion that land has its own wisdom, that land is, is already resilient, and so that oftentimes in restoration what I would like to keep in, in mind is that it's not necessarily the land that's broken, but it's our relationship to it, and that what we really need to restore is that, that relationship. And the question, of course, is, is, is what is the right relationship to land? And there I've found traditional knowledge to be very helpful, having evolved over millennia of, of people learning by experiments and living on, sustainably on, on, on the land. And I think some of the things that, that traditional knowledge gives us about that right relationship to land is one of partnership. Um, we say in, in our traditions that, that human beings were the last created, and therefore our job is that of, of, of stewardship and, and caregiving. But that requires you to be a participant in the ecosystem, not standing on the outside, but to be an active member of that community. And so, so participation in the, in the ecosystem is, is important to me in a role of reciprocity. Um, so that as the land gives to us, our job then we get, is to give back in, in kind. And I think those are some of the, the lessons of, of traditional knowledge for how to live in, in right relationship. It's people and what we do. I think restoration in its broadest sense is this reconnecting, uh, reconnecting the parts of our natural system, the forest, the streams, uh, the mountains, the lowlands, the ocean. Uh, it's that reconnection and it's also reconnecting people with that land um, and people with their memory that may be getting slightly fainter. And, um, so the, um, I think the other important part of that broader sense of restoration as, re as reconnection is that 
restoration is part of caring for the land and building an enduring home in that land. But the other part is conserving, protecting, recognizing the parts of your land that are functional, that are healthy, and making sure that you keep them and don't damage them. And then the parts that are diminished or dampened, you do something to restore them and let those natural components within them, the strength, the spark, the energy, uh, let it be magnified by your actions or, or lack of, of impacts. So reconnecting is a fundamental word here. Right. Are there yeah, some others that have come up in the workshop that resonate yeah. with you? Reconnection is extremely important because it is a process of reconnecting the parts of the system that work together. Connections that may have been weakened by some of our actions. And uh, so reconnecting forest and stream and stream and estuary and uh, the land to the sea. Another term that's extremely important is the idea of confluence. In streams, we find that confluences are extremely rich pieces of the river network. It's the coming together of different sizes of streams with different species, different components, and you have the richness of what is brought in by a little tributary into a larger stream, and you have the mix of species and the mix of food supplies. And if something happens, like a flood, one part of that system may be experiencing the flood, the other isn't. And so one part can serve as a refuge while the other undergoes the change. Um, and so that idea of confluence is extremely important. It's a rich piece of the landscape. And in restoration, much of what we're talking about is a confluence of what we're trying to um, maintain in nature. And the people that are part of that system, the coming together of all the members of our community. We all influence the land we live in. And so it's a confluence of all the people and all the actions. And in doing so, it provides us a sense of community and that no one is evil, no one is trying to destroy the earth, but yet our individual actions can diminish it. And so through this confluence of people, we can have people coming together and try to find uh, a common hope and a common home that they're trying to build. Well, to me, the, the idea of restoration was, it is so, so very hopeful um, because it, you know, it allows for the possibility of a future that's got wildness and diversity in it, you know, a wildness that, that's other than human and diversity that's other than human. Um, this gathering is showing a, an enormous range of, of wisdoms about restoration. Um, so, so this is just sort of my, uh, my bit. Um, I've felt throughout my whole engagement with the ecology movement over the last 30 years, this tremendous sense of, of loss of landscape and loss of wildness. And uh, when I began to learn of restoration and the idea that, that uh, human beings could give back to the landscape, you know, through skill and, and attentiveness and care could... Uh, restore some possibility of wildness. I just found it thrilling, you know. I mean, this is an essential part of uh, part of what we need to be doing on this planet from hence. Uh, that said, um, it turns out now under these current circumstances of continuing habitat disturbance and, and alien species invasion that um, restoration becomes preservation. You know, that, that uh, a lot of the activities of restoration, the kind of um, tending and uh, weeding and, and uh, um, sort of maintaining the, the essential character of a site, 
um, it just, you know, their wildness is not going to be preserved without that kind of a protective attention and selective uh, care. So it's it's tremendously important work. And what I hear from the folks who are, are directly involved in it, and I meet lots of people who are engaged in restoration, is that, you know, finally, finally, there's something to do in relation to the world that's not, you know, crushing cans for recycling and, and not just writing a letter to the congressman to try to prevent the latest horror, but to actually, you know, go out into the neighborhood and, and recover the stream or plant a series of prairie lawns uh, on your street and have the chance to, um, for the neighbors to learn, you know, what was here uh, before, before the fescue and the, the mowers and that kind of thing.